Hi everyone. After writing In Search of King Solomon's Mines, formerly known as On Gilded Ground, I was still with John Murray, the publisher, and they were just selling out to WH Smith, the news agent. I was incandescent with misery and anger. It was, it was so wrong. And I've never, ever, ever forgiven John Murray, who owned John Murray, John Murray the seventh, I think, for selling his deliriously fabulous publishing company to W.H. Smith. And it was later, later taken over by Hoda Headline and I think it's owned by Hachette now. In the old days when you were published by John Murray, you were taken in to their drawing rooms to the room where Byron burnt his diaries and they had his nightshirt, I think, in a glass case. They were so incredibly accommodating to authors, so kind, so generous. When my daughter Ariane was born, they sent the biggest bouquet of flowers I had ever seen. And when they invited me to lunch the first time, they pointed to the most expensive thing on the menu and suggested I have that. <laughs> um, I loved them at first until they sold out. I wrote two books for John Murray. My second one was called House of the Tiger King. It was really um, the basis of... It was, it was a documentary that I made of the same title, House of the Tiger King. You can find it on YouTube a crazy, long, hard documentary, zigzag journey through the Madre de Dios jungle of Peru. And I went there with my Swedish friends, Leon and David Flamhock, and we searched for Paititi, the greatest lost city of the Americas, the Inca city. And we promised each other that if we ever found it, we would pretend we didn't, because if we had found it and publicized it, the jungle that we so loved and respected would have been torn down. This manuscript, it's not a thick one. It's not a big book. I think it was like 60,000 words, 65 maybe. And at the front of this, I've got, I've got the plan of the book. I always make very detailed plans. And there's some scribbled notes here. And I like, um, I love looking at the plans of my books rather than, you know, the manuscripts themselves. Out of all my books, and I've written quite a lot of books now, <laughs> I love the opening of this book. I was in a kind of bizarre heart of darkness kind of frame of mind. I wrote this in 2003 in the summer and it was hot. And I mean hot in London, it was like 35 degrees. But for a, in a house, you know, with no cooling system, and not much of a heating system for that matter, I remember writing just in my boxer shorts day after day. This is how House of the Tiger King begins. The men had lost their smiles and their cheap grins. Their cheeks were gaunt and unshaved their eyes ringed with dark circles. I sensed their hatred, their judgment. They would have killed me if they thought they could have got away with it. But their fatigue was so extreme that none of them could devise a plan with which to end my life. We crouched on the shore, cold crunching pebbles beneath our boots. No one had the energy to speak. We had progressed or regressed to a state of dumbness. Language merely reminded us of the suffering. With a fleeting telepathic glance, I could now quiz the porters about their loads, tell them to rest or give the detested order to move on. The canopy of jungle hung like a tremendous barricade, concealing us from the real world. There was an energy about it, a despicable power, a sense of consciousness. It watched you scanning your movements, observing 
minutely as you stumbled ahead through the river. Thank God for the river. It was the only blessed thing for a thousand miles. The slick ribbon of water had allowed us to traverse the densest cloud forest on earth. Madre de Dios, the mother of God. This isn't one of my more, you know, big deal books, but it's one that I'm proud of writing, proud of having written. It would have been much easier not to write this book, but I forced myself to write it because I wanted a literary version of the documentary, kind of as a testament for, my, for myself, House of the Tiger King.